fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to another episode of the Falcoholic Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Knight at Falcoholic Kevin, here on a, a somber day uh, as the Falcons on Monday placed star tight end Kyle Pitts on injured reserve with what is believed to be a torn MCL that will end his season, sadly. And that wasn't the only hit because uh, we also lost Taquan Graham, the defensive tackle, who's having a very strong second season also to injured reserve, but the details on his injury were a lot less clear, but he was carted off. So I think we probably have to assume the worst considering how quickly both were placed on IR just a day after suffering the injuries. Um, Big blows to the Falcons, obviously. So today we're going to talk about some options to potentially replace them, how big of a deal these losses are. uh, And just try to, uh, to see if this is something that the Falcons can weather. Um, obviously the, 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 (laughs) the depth in the the receiving core is not fantastic. I think that it's certainly better than it was last year, but the depth on the defensive interior is even worse. Um, so that there's a lot of of big question marks there, uh, certainly. And I I think at tight end, there's also significant question marks, but we're going to start with Kyle Pitts, obviously, because that is the big news. Um, and what I want to address first is all the people that are saying like, oh, well, you know, the Falcons still throw the the ball very often. Kyle Pitts wasn't getting that many targets. So who cares? Like, it's not going to change anything. And I, I don't think that's anywhere remotely close to true. I mean, obviously it's been really disappointing to see, uh, the lack of passing game success this year for the Falcons. Um, you know, with, with Kyle Pitts, the targets have been there pretty consistently. Um, certainly not at, at the volume of like a high octane passing attack, but Pitts has 59 targets on the season. So he was, I think, on pace probably to, to crest that 100 target mark. But just 28 of them were caught, and that's because over 30% of his targets were considered uncatchable, uh, according to various charting services. Uh, and that's a Marcus Mariota problem. The chemistry was just never there. So it's really sad uh, to, to see that. But Pitts was a huge part of this offense, the threat that he brings. And yes, the blocking, which was improving to the point where he was actually a, a factor as a blocker. Um, this offense without Kyle Pitts, the, the big issue isn't necessarily in lost production in terms of like raw yardage catch numbers. It's It's... You know, some people call him a decoy, and that's not really fair because he's out there probably getting open and getting targeted, just not having the ball thrown in his zip code a lot of the time. Um, But Pitts does offer a lot as a decoy. That is true. Uh, The Falcons need everything that they, they can get to sort of take the attention off the run game, which is the real engine of this offense. We know how limited the passing game is with Mariota and... When we ask him to throw the ball too much, bad things happen. Um, so I, I think it's very important to be able to threaten the passing game to take some of the, the pressure off of the run game to do everything. And without Kyle Pitts in the building, you have to think that's going to be much harder. The attention that he demands on every play is is very significant. Um so I, I think that the narrative of, oh, well, it doesn't matter because they don't throw the, they, you know, he like, who cares because, you know, he's not catching that many passes anyway. Like, get get your fantasy stuff out of here. Like, we're, obviously, he's a disappointing fantasy player, but um, very crucial to the way this offense works. Um, he caught two touchdowns this year and was was one of the most dangerous players on the field at any given time. So losing that really puts a lot of pressure on the rest of this offense to make plays because that that threat has now been taken away defenses can sort of breathe easy you know rotate all of their coverage to drake london and just shut down the run game and that's a lot easier than having to account for two potential very dangerous passing game threats as opposed to just the one now in drake london um so it's not going to do anything good for this offense it's going to be it's going to make it things a lot more difficult um and i there's not really any player you could bring in to replicate Kyle Pitts there's nobody like that out there in free agency nobody that you could add um so we'll start with you know how might they go about replacing him and and it's probably just going to be that 
I mean, if it was me, I would probably just say like tight ends, you're blocking, um, and you're catching an occasional pass. And I, I think I've liked what we've seen from Michael Pruitt, uh, for the most part. Uh, I, I think he's been a pretty solid pass catcher. Um, uh, and Parker Hesse to his credit has, has been, you know, solid on dump offs and things like that as well. Um, but they don't really have a dynamic presence there. I mean, they do have Felipe Franks, right? So the the sad, unfortunate truth is that we're probably going to see a lot more Felipe Franks once he's healthy, um, which I know everyone just loathes. But uh, that's why they kept him around, to be the Kyle Pitts backup. Um, so we can only hope, I guess, that Franks realizes some of that potential and and is able to to play like he was in the preseason, play like he was in training camp, where he was looking really good, um, like really impressive, like one of the most impressive players in training camp. I don't know what happened when the lights came on in the game. He looks sort of timid. He He's bobbled a bunch of passes. I don't, you know, this is a guy that hasn't played tight end, um, really, in, in a professional setting. You know, in college, he was a quarterback as well. So, it's, it's different when you get into a real game and you have to sort of do something you, you're not very familiar with. So I think there's still some hope that Felipe Franks can turn into something, but I wouldn't expect him to be a Kyle Pitts level threat or anything even remotely close to that. But perhaps he can he can do something there. But I think we're going to see a lot more Pruitt and Hesse as blockers. Um, we could potentially see Anthony Ferkser activated once again. Um Who's, he's been a game day inactive most of the year now. He's only appeared in five of the 11 games. Um, sort of seems to have fallen out of favor uh, in favor of like the blocking of Michael Pruitt and Parker Hesse and even Felipe Franks. So it's entirely possible we see Ferkser activated now um, and, and playing. I, I think Ferkser has been better than Felipe Franks, but the coaching staff seems to prefer Franks because of his similarities to Pitts in terms of size, athleticism, that sort of thing. So yeah. Um, I'm not really sure we'll see any additional signings. The fact is we're already carrying five tight ends, which is a lot more like more than probably any other team at this point in the season. So I don't think a signing is likely. We did see uh, John rain come back to the practice squad uh, tight end who was with the team for two trading camps. Now Um, always been sort of a a fringe roster guy. So he's in the practice squad now as an emergency backup. I'm happy to see him return, but I, I don't think that, he's likely to be a roster elevation unless Franks is like not able to go because the Falcons seem pretty content to, to activate four tight ends, at least three on any given game day. So um, we'll see if that continues uh, and if John Rain does end up getting any action. But at this point, um, it's really tough to, to see them bringing in an impact, you know, tight end. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so they really just have to weather it and, uh, it's it's going to probably mean a lot more wide receiver focus. Um, we've seen Demir Bird sort of come on uh, to become like the fourth target in the passing game. Um, you know, that I think that's a nice thing. He'll probably have to be more like the third target. I think we should see more of Kadero Hodge as well, who I think has really shown that he's a capable wide receiver as well as a special teams player. Um, I like I like what we've seen from him. Obviously, Zacchaeus is going to be relied upon even more. Um, and Drake London is going to continue to have to play his role of being the, the number one target. Um, it's So it's, it's probably going to mean more wide receiver focus. Um, but again, this is a low-volume passing game. There's not that many targets to go around. So in terms of the receiving production, it's, it's more... They just have to sort of get by without pits. I, I don't think it's going to be anything good i think it's going to drag down the offense even more um and like to be fair right now the the falcons are 12th uh in scoring still at, at going into week 12 in the nfl and that's very impressive um so i think props are deserved by the by Mariota, by the coaching staff by the running backs by everyone for for turning in a, an efficient offense that's you know, not throwing the ball very much. They're, they're still 31st in passing attempts. Um, they are also 31st in yardage, but they're, they've been efficient. They're closer to, to slightly above average in terms of net yards per attempt in the passing game. And there's no way that's going to stay the same without Kyle Pitts. So um, it, it's going to be tough uh, to keep it, to keep the offense going without him. I, I think it's going to lead to my, the Falcons already face stack boxes, I think more than any other offense. Um, I haven't, 
seen that stat updated in a few weeks, so that might not be like entirely accurate now, but they're definitely near the top in terms of stacked boxes faced by their running backs. And that's only going to get worse now. Um, and the Falcons have shown that they're starting to struggle to run on those stacked boxes. They, they were doing a really good job of it earlier in the year, but um, you know, with the loss of Elijah Wilkinson, Drew Dahlman wasn't playing particularly great over the past few games. He did have a bounce back game against the bears, but um I just have a hard time feeling like this is going to turn out well. I think this this could be where we we see the offense take a nosedive. I'm I'm hopeful that because they've managed to be so good on the ground and and the passing game is lower volume, it won't be as crushing as it could have been for like the Matt Ryan Falcons last year without Kyle Pitts. You know, it was a serious drop off uh, without him out there. It's a serious drop off. Um, it's hard it's harder to quantify because of just. Pitts was needed just to take attention off the run game, even if he wasn't, unfortunately, getting a lot of accurate targets thrown his way. Um, but I, it, it's not they've, that's gone, almost certainly for the rest of the season. So they're going to have to adjust, find a way. You know, it, I would hope that Mariota could be more effective on the ground. He's he's really fallen off as a runner um, since the beginning of the season. I mean, this last week, I think he had near his season high in rushing attempts mariota um with 13 uh yeah he did it was his it was a season high uh averaging just like under two yards a carry uh 13 carries for 25 yards and that's you know pitiful um and, and his yards per attempt has been steadily dropping um since the carolina victory uh that was his i think last game where he, he, had, he did a good job um but like it, it they need him to probably run closer to like seven to eight times a game. Um, the past few weeks, he's been efficient as a runner, but hasn't run a lot. So like um, against Carolina in week 10, he did average like 14 yards per carry, only ran the ball three times, but it was very effective there uh, against Los Angeles in week nine, five carries for 24 yards, which is a little under five yards per carry, but that's still fine. Um, we need him to get close to that probably seven to eight carry mark um, to to really overcome the loss of pits. So I, I still, you know, I think this was just an off game against Chicago um, to have that little production on, on 13 carries. He did get the touchdown on the one carry. So that's obviously nice. They're going to need that like more than ever uh, with, with Kyle Pitts going out. So it's definitely an opportunity for Mariota to continue to show that that's why he's, he's starting is partially because of his ability to move the ball on the ground. Um, they, they desperately, need that uh ground production to help <laughs> uh because it's it's going to be dire potentially on offense if they if they without Kyle Pitts out here um just very difficult uh to move the ball without one of your top one of your top weapons um so I I hope that they're able to to do something uh figure something out you know maybe this is Felipe Frank's time but I, I know that makes a lot of people uh very upset when they hear that so Moving on to the next player uh, placed on IR, that is Taquan Graham, the defensive tackle. Graham wasn't like a full-time starter per se, but I definitely, uh, he started nine games officially, played in all 11. Um, but I think Graham was definitely one of the team's best interior defenders. Uh, was really having a nice second year. Uh, this is for a guy who was like a fifth-round pick coming in and, and being a quality rotational piece. That's that's nice. You certainly like to see that. Um, so it's, I think, a big loss, especially considering how limited the Falcons are on the interior. Um, you know, I, I believe he was their highest. Technically, he's, he's higher graded than Grady Jarrett, which is, you know, that's ridiculous. Like, I think they the PFF, I don't really like their grades, to, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, they, they gave Grady Jarrett like a 40 PFF grade for that game against the Bears, even though he had like a sack and some other stuff. So just a very bizarre, you know, I don't really agree with their their grading for the most part. But they do have take quite Graham graded as the highest interior defender for the Falcons. So that's, uh, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, so without him... Other than Grady Jarrett, it's really quite dire. Um, the Falcons did recently get Jalen Dalton back in the lineup. He hasn't really made much of an impact so far. Um, so we'll see. He's going to be asked to play a much bigger role now, I'd imagine. Um, they did get back Jaleel Johnson, who's one of the players 
uh, was the player they claimed off waivers after, <clears throat> excuse me, after Taquan Graham went down. Um, Jaleel Johnson's been having a bad season, according to PFF. Uh, he's only played about 86 snaps so far, but the Falcons had him on the practice squad. He was signed away. Now he's come back. So clearly there's something there that they like. Um, and, you know, I, I think the the emergence of Abdullah Anderson is like a quality piece, I think is nice. Um, you know, so that that helps a little bit. But really, it's, it's just Grady Jarrett right now um, in terms of players that are impact guys. Um, you know, we, we've yet to see anything from Matt Dickerson, who the team claimed as like their their final roster cuts claim. He's only played 39 snaps and he's generally been inactive. They're carrying him on the roster, so clearly they think there's something there. So maybe we'll finally get a chance to see that. I don't know. He was not good when he played early in the year, certainly. Um, but in terms of it, like, there's just not much out there. Like, I've been clamoring for them to sign Linval Joseph all uh, all season. Um, he goes and signs off the street with the Eagles and has a great game, you know, when he comes back. So, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that they either that these players aren't interested in coming to Atlanta or the Falcons aren't really interested in bringing them in. Um, cause they're trying to save their, their money, uh, for, for next year, which I think is also logical. <laughs> um, so it, this is just not a defensive interior or a front seven in general that can sustain any injuries at all and still play well. I mean, we've seen how tenuous the defense as a whole was, you know, they lost AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward, you know, and any defense that loses their top two corners at the same time, is going to struggle. But the Falcons then became like the worst passing defense in the NFL, um, so I think losing, you know, one of your only good interior defenders uh, is going to be bad, certainly. So we'll hope that some combination of these of these other guys, um, you know, Abdullah Anderson, like I mentioned, uh, Jalen Dalton, maybe Matt Dickerson finally gets on the field. Uh, Jaleel Johnson coming in. Um, you know, I love Jaleel Johnson coming out of college. It has not gone particularly well for him, sadly. But, uh, you know, fi- maybe the reunion finally comes together here in Atlanta. Um, but it's it's pretty dire there. I mean, it was dire before. It's really dire now. So it's it's a tough spot. Um, and injuries happen to every team. The Falcons have had their fair share already. Um, these ones certainly make things more difficult. Uh, it's like right as the secondary might finally start to be healthier again. Um, they lose even more guys. So it's... It's hard to say exactly what this will do. I mean, the Falcons' defense, I think, has been solid over the last couple of weeks. I mean, they, they gave up a lot of ground yards to the Panthers, but that game was still in contention. And then um, they they did a good job against the Bears, I thought. Um, you know, only giving up 160 rush yards to the Bears, who are the best rushing attack in the NFL. That That's a win, for sure. Um, so they, they've been sort of frisky and, 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 and feisty and... and managed to keep scores within reason for the most part. I think losing Taquan Graham certainly hurts that, but I don't think it's as pivotal a loss as the Kyle Pitts injury. Uh, there's probably a few players on this team that would be more pivotal to lose than Pitts, so it's not really a fair comparison, but certainly hope that, that Graham's okay. We haven't gotten a ton of details on the injury yet. Hopefully it's not something that's going to affect his his 2023 season in any way, but just a really difficult turn of events for the Falcons who finally, you know, got back in the wind column, snapped that two game losing streak, uh, five and six, the bucks are just five and five. They were on by this week. So, um, there, there is a chance for a playoff run here. The Falcons, I think improved their odds to like 20% with the win, uh, over the bears. They have a, a great chance to get wins over a lot of wildcard teams at this point. Um, the, the commanders who they're playing this week are currently holding one of the wild card spots. The Falcons, you know, if the Falcons were to beat them, get to six and six and push down, of course, the commanders to six and six, uh, they would then have the head to head tiebreaker over Washington. And I believe that would potentially move them into one of the wild card spots. Um, well, I guess, no, the. Washington's not in the wild card right now. I think they are they're close, but they're not in the wild card right now. So it depends on, on what happens with the other teams in the NFC East, right? I mean, I think a lot of people expect the New York Giants to fall off. Um, I think I was getting the Giants and Washington confused in the standings. But yeah, Washington's only six and five. So it still helps though. Like Washington's right on the cusp of that wild card if the Giants continue to falter. 
the Falcons getting a, a head-to-head win over Washington. They also have head-to-head wins over Seattle, over San Francisco. Um, <clears throat> that is is helpful, right? Because those are potential wild card opponents. Getting that head-to-head tiebreaker gives you a little bit more leeway, you know, another an extra game leeway essentially where you can be tied with these teams and, and still make the playoffs. So I think it's a much d- more difficult hill to climb now without Kyle Pitts and, and without Taquan Graham to some extent. Um, I I think it's it 20% is probably about where I'd peg the odds, uh, but it it's tough. It's very tough. Um, the, and the commanders, I think, are a really tough matchup for this team. We just saw them, you know, dominate the Texans, which is the Texans, so whatever. But it's a good defense. The Falcons have not played well against good defenses. They, they just, they don't do well against good defenses. Um, they're 12th in points, 6th in yards, and they're really good at stopping the run. So it it's a bad setup this week for Atlanta now without Kyle Pitts to threaten because the, the commanders in terms of defending the pass are a little bit less good at defending the pass. You know, they're 12th in yards. Um, they, they've given up a lot of passing touchdowns, 18. So like it, it, they're not a bad pass defense or a bad, they're, they're a very good rush offense and they're, and they're sort of a, I would say above average pass defense on the whole. Um, so they're, they're a good defense, but the Falcons have to find a way to move the ball against them. Um, you know, the saving grace is that that offense is just completely inconsistent. Um, I think most weeks they've scored less than 20 points, but then they have a couple of like 30 and 27 ish point games to their name they only scored 23 against the Texans. It's not a world beating defense by any means. So there's always the chance that you get bad Heineke, right? And then you get some turnovers off that, and that's your ticket. Certainly, a game that the Falcons could win. Um, I, I think they're only like three and a half or four point underdogs, so it's not completely out of the realm of the possibility. But we're in a di- it's a <clears throat> it's a very difficult spot to be in, right? Um, the Falcons really desperately have to win these next two games. The Commanders won much more important, I think, than the, the Steelers won in terms of standings and lots of things. But it it's a tough, tough ask. I, I really do think that it's going to be difficult for this team to to come away with those, with those wins. Um, I think if they do beat the Commanders this week, it'll be a much better shot. Like, then it's like, oh, well, they can beat the Steelers then. Um, and I think if they do go into the bye with that winning record that they've been chasing since 2017, um, I think it's it, it, the chances are much better. You know, the Cardinals are, are not looking very feisty. Uh, the Saints are the Saints, and, and they're always going to play the Falcons tough, but the Falcons are always going to play them tough, and that game is always going to be a coin flip. So there's a chance, you know, if you can just beat the, the Cardinals and the Saints in that last stretch – going into that week 17 game with the bucks that's probably going to be it could be a winner take all sort of game so i think if if the falcons even if they just show up to week 17 in a game for a potential playoff spot i think that's a success um so we'll we'll see how it plays out this commanders game is pretty vital for all the reasons i mentioned Uh, it's going to be tough for them to overcome these losses like we said but um yeah I, i i think they've got a shot and I, and I think they're going to have to lean more on the run game and, and really try to diversify the passing game. I don't know if they can. I, I think this, this this type of loss to your offense could be crippling. It could be the start, unfortunately, of like a, you know, cascading slide down. But it's also an opportunity for the Falcons to diversify the offense and, and really try to, to win in other ways, um, try to find ways to get around get around it and, and innovate. And I think Arthur Smith, to his credit, has managed to, to do that on, on occasion. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, tough game this week. That's going to tell us a lot about the direction of this team. Um, but yeah, uh, tough break going into this into week 12. But it happens to every team. You have to figure out ways to get around the injuries. So that's where we are now at the Falcons, dealing with yet another uh, crushing loss to a star uh, of a star player at this point. But guys... Thank you for, for tuning in today. Appreciate that. Uh, you can like and subscribe if you're watching the show on YouTube. We really appreciate that. If you're listening to the audio, give us a five-star review. 
Uh, we will have a Wednesday night Falcoholic Live once again. That'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern. So join us and some join me and some guests for that. You can also check out our Patreon if you're interested in supporting the show. It's patreon.com slash Falcoholic Live. Uh, lots of exclusive perks there, including early access, ad-free versions of all the podcast episodes, and more. So check that out. Um, we will be having a, a very special guest on the next podcast episode, which will be coming out on Friday. Uh, it is going to be Anthony Armstrong, former Commanders wide receiver, who will be joining me for the Commanders game preview. So uh, a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that one for sure. Like I said, that'll be coming out later this week. So lots of good content coming your way. We also, of course, have a full smorgasbord of games on Thanksgiving, which actually all look pretty good. Uh, so I'm excited for that. Uh, obviously, keep your eyes on thefalcoholic.com for all that terrific written content as well. Um, and you can follow me, Kevin Knight, on Twitter at Falcoholic Kevin. So, hey guys, thanks again for listening, for watching. We'll see you guys next time on the Falcoholic Podcast. Have a great day, folks.